bit about that. So when I was seven years old, as a young boy, I'd made a false profession of faith. <clears throat> I somewhat got pushed up to the altar and was taken in the back room, was told to repeat a prayer. And I didn't even pray. I didn't know what was going on. And so I uh, got out from, from that to a very emotional experience. People were hugging me, telling me that I had gotten saved. And, you know, when I, when I look back at that, I, I think people just genuinely thought that I got saved. It wasn't a, you know, it wasn't a deception type thing. They just, they, they thought I got saved, but I didn't. And so for the next 11 years of my life, if I thought about eternity, I went back to that emotional experience. And, you know, everybody, you know, when they get saved, there's, people have different experiences. But if your trust is in the experience, then it's misplaced. And uh, that's, that's where I was at when I was 18. Uh, my wife, which is my girlfriend then, began to provoke me to get back into church. And so I did. I was there one night, and an evangelist came through. Uh, he was preaching. I can't, can't really even tell you what the man was preaching about, but I remember very specifically being in the pew and God dealing with my heart. And he took me back to when I was seven and made it abundantly clear that what I had at seven years old wasn't the real thing. And so that was March the 1st of 2008, uh, I submitted myself to the righteousness of God by faith in Jesus Christ, and the Lord began to, to change my life immediately. And uh, so I, I have a secular degree. I began university in the fall of that same year. And as I'm driving to school in the mornings, the Lord begins to put this thing of foreign missions in my heart. Now, the church that I grew up in, uh, we supported just a handful of missionaries. I don't know that I ever met one uh, person to person, and so I didn't, I didn't really understand this. And so for about four months, the Lord dealt with my heart about this. And so I just, after that, I kind of brushed it aside, kind of had my own plans, wanted to do my own thing. And uh, didn't, I didn't think about it until years later. Fast forward to 2015, my dad passes away. And uh, my dad was a very special man in my life. I, I could sit up here and tell you stories about him and how I wouldn't be up here today if it weren't for him. But, but the Lord uh, decided to take him and... Uh, my wife and I have been praying for years about switching churches. I grew up in a, it was really a family, family church, and you know, there, there can be some problems associated with that. And uh, we, we prayed for about two years, uh, seriously, about going somewhere else. And so it wasn't, wasn't a, a, it wasn't a decision that we just made on, on the fly. And uh, so Lord, Lord moved us to Cornerstone Baptist Church, which is where we're at now. And uh, first night we went, there was a man preaching there by the name of Lee Cadenhead. He was the man in the video that you've seen me pictured side by side with. And uh, the Lord, Lord changed my, he, he, he did a special work in my heart that night. I'm convinced had I went in there lost, I would have come out saved. That's how big that night was in my life. And uh, so we got plugged in there at Cornerstone. I got a lot of needed help um, really in the domestic realm. My dad was a, I, I couldn't have asked for a better father, but he wasn't the best example as a husband. And so I, I really needed some help in that area. Lord, Lord help me. And um, I'm going through the Bible Institute, and I come to Genesis 12, 1. This is 2017. Keep in mind, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about what the Lord did in my heart since 2008. And I come to Genesis 12, 1, where the Bible says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, and it's, you, you know, when you're studying the Bible, and it's just like that word had took up the entire page. I didn't see anything else. And the Lord took me back to 2008. And uh, I understood at that time what the Lord was doing. And I, I told the Lord at that point that I, that I would go wherever and I would do whatever he wanted me to do. And, you know, so naturally I began to, you know, get a map out and fantasize about, you know, the Lord wants me here, the Lord wants me there. And I prayed about New York City. I prayed about California. I, pr I prayed about everywhere in the world, China. I really, really, really wanted to go to Brazil. And um, I tried to make some things happen and the Lord shut the door on that, thankfully. And so uh, by a fruit of a prayer meeting with two of my best friends, the Lord initially led us to South Africa. And so my wife and I took a trip over there and the trip went well, we got back, but I never could get complete peace that that's where the Lord wanted us. And so for about two years, I lived in frustration because I wanted the Lord to give me I wanted him to give me the green light now. I want to go now. And, uh, you know, I couldn't understand it at the time, but I can look back now and see exactly what the Lord was doing. And uh, at the same time, <clears throat> Brother Lee moves up from uh, a church he was pastoring in South Alabama to Cornerstone. He and I end up on the same street providentially. We had Africa in common. And so I'm, I'm planning a trip back to South Africa at the same time. He's planning a trip into Zimbabwe. 
and um, he, he had no intention of, of going to the country at this point. And so he approached me and said, hey, I'm already going to Zimbabwe. He said, uh, Jeff Porter is there. He said he spent over 20 years in South Africa. He said it would be a good contact for you to make. He said, why don't you just tag along with me? And he said, after that, we can head down to South Africa, find, find the things that you want to find out. And I said, that, that sounds like a good plan. Um, initially, that, that trip was planned for the middle of 2020. And uh, some of you immediately are thinking of, of something called COVID. And uh, so we're planning this a year in advance. I'm not really, pl I'm planning my trip around what Brother Lee and Brother Jeff are, are doing. Somehow the trip got pushed up to the first of the year. So we get, we get to take the trip. Uh, on the plane right over there, I, I come to Nehemiah chapter 6 in my Bible reading. Uh, I began my normal cyclical Bible reading very shortly after I'd gotten saved. I was 18. At the time I'm on the plane, I'm 29. And so I come to Nehemiah 6. I don't have my wide margin Bible with me. I'll show you the notes that I'd made. The, the page is full of notes where, where I just the Lord was showing me things. And I'm one of those guys, you know, I read through my Bible regularly. But if I'm in my normal reading and the Lord just starts speaking to me, I, I'll sit down. And uh, so I did that day, and we got off the plane. Brother Jeff picks us up. He takes us to his house. I sat down that night to make sense out of what I put in my Bible and put it on paper, and nothing made sense. It's like someone had locked my brain down. And so, you know, I tell the Lord, I'm not, not real sure what all that was about. It made complete sense on the plane. Can't make sense out of it now. And so I'm laying there early the next morning, and uh, I can't sleep. The mosquitoes are buzzing around my ears. It's hot. I'm trying to sleep with a towel over my head. And I just begin to pray. And you know, um, sometimes, it, well, not sometimes, it just be, we just need to get honest with, with the Lord because he already knows our thoughts. He, he already knows what we need in these type of things. And, I, you know, I've had to stop myself in my prayers before because I'm, I'm, I'm lying to God. Like he doesn't understand what's going on. And so I just, I just tell the Lord, Lord, um, you know I'm not 100% sure that you want me to go to South Africa. I, saw, I said, Lord, in my spirit right now, that's what I feel. And I said, Lord, that's the best I know, and that's why I'm pursuing that. But I said, Lord, if you got something else, I'm open. And I get up the next morning. I come to Nehemiah 7-1. Keep in mind I'm staying with Jeff and Cindy Porter. Um, I, I'm 8,000 miles away from home. I, I'm just, I'm just going to Zimbabwe to get to South Africa. I have absolutely no intention of coming to Zimbabwe. You're not going to find Zimbabwe in the Bible. The closest you'll get is Ethiopia. But I come to Nehemiah 7 and 1. The Bible says, Now it came to pass when the wall was built, and I'd set up the doors and the porters. And, you know, that, that catches my attention. I could have been staying with Jeff and Cindy Smith. So, I, you know, I, I begin to ponder this in my heart. I don't want to go to seat on that. And so Brother Jeff takes me on a bike ride through the bush. Uh, he's going to have me preach in a church that he had started up there, a place called Mount Salinda. And he takes a Sunday school lesson. He's going to give me the preaching service. And his lesson is from Genesis 12:1, which is the verse that God had used many years uh, prior to that to, to rekindle in my heart what he had did in 2008 when I was 18. And, you know, when I, when I began to, to think about that, that's not a coincidence. I just prayed that that same day the Lord does two very very big things and uh, so it was a very surreal moment in my life i'm sitting on this bench you know uh, just a it was just a, a tree log in essence and it was it was a real surreal moment in my life because i understood that the, that the lord had his hand in this and uh so <clears throat> at the same time we go through the city of mutari the lord begins to uh speak to brother lee's heart about the city uh he told me he he said brother if i didn't know my marching orders back home he said i'd be moving my family here and unbeknownst to me, he begins to pray that I would go there. He never told me that. He has a podcast that I find out years later on that he began to pray that I would go there. And so we get home, COVID happens, everything slows down, and I understand that I have some time. And I just, I just began to ask the Lord that he would raise up a family out of Cornerstone to go labor with us. It wasn't a bargain with God. I wasn't telling him I'm not going to go unless you do this. But the Lord answered that prayer. And at that point, I was just uh, beyond re, beyond. Uh, 100% sure that God wanted us to go to Zimbabwe. And so the opportunity was presented to, to my family to be able to go over with the Cadenhead family for a, for a short protracted survey when they went and deployed full time. And so I quit my job last February, well, February 2022, and we went over with them. The Lord prospered our trip. Uh, you know, if you ever get to the, the opportunity to take a short term mission trip, you ought to do that. I'm up here as a product of that because I took short term mission trips. 
But at the same time, you know, the, the plane ride to Zimbabwe is 36 hours. By the time you get over there, two weeks later, you're just getting adjusted and you're coming back. And uh, we're there for three months, got to see people get saved, got to disciple people, got to, got to build relationships. And I, I have contact with these guys on a daily basis. I, just, I was just talking with a man over there. Paul, actually, the guy that was in the white shirt in, in the video, um, I'd love to tell you the stories. Those pictures were not just random. All, all of those pictures tell a story. But um, I, I have contact with these guys on a daily basis. So we're, we're excited about getting back to that and uh, getting back involved. And so what's, what's going on in Zimbabwe? Nothing novel. We've started these Bible studies. And we just go in and pour the Bible into them. We don't have any other kind of, you know, the Bible still works. It, and it just, it just needs a man to teach it. And so um, we go in. I, I'm not interested in exporting American Christianity. It's trash. I'm not e interested in getting these people to be, be Zimbabwean Christians. We want them to be biblical Christians. And so that's what we do. And we just trust that the Lord is, takes these Bible studies and develops these into churches. And so one of these in particular has. And so Cornerstone Bible Baptist Church, they organized uh, officially about two months ago. And so the plan is, is for that to be a beachhead uh, where we would train men to send out into Zimbabwe and beyond. And so we don't want to limit the Lord. We just, we just want to be part of what he wants, wants to go on there. And so, um, and then, then the long-term plan is to, is to work ourselves out of a job and move somewhere else. And so that's, that's really the, um, uh, that, I know that's a skeleton of what's, there's a lot of other things that, that you understand that goes on uh, happening there. And so that's our plan. Uh, we got back, in essence, at the 1st of July of last year. We, we began deputation immediately. And so we're, we're right at a year into it. We're at 85%. And so here's what's happened of, of late. Last Wednesday, our, uh, they call it a TIP. It's a temporary employment permit. We, well, we didn't submit it. There was a, a church, a family from our church that went over to, to visit the Catenhead family. They took our paperwork and the funds it's a very expensive process, and so cash is not, um, it's, it's somewhat hard to come by over there. So they, they took all that over there, and uh, Brother Jeff Porter submitted our paperwork on our behalf, and so we have to be out of the country for that to be submitted anyways. And so he submitted that, and normally, uh, you know, we're talking about Africa, so uh, normal is not necessarily normal, but uh, it, it normally takes about two to three weeks for, for, to get that back. It's pretty standard business although it is an election year and so there are some question marks and so um either by maybe by next wednesday we'll know a yay or a nay and uh, we asked for two years normally what they've been awarding is one year this this uh this permit is renewable in country and it's pretty standard business brother lee's been there for going on two years brother jeff has been there almost 12 years on the same permit and so uh we're hopeful but uh, we do need the Lord to, to work on our behalf and to uh, help us to get that approved. And so upon approval of that, we're buying our tickets for the last week of September, probably that Monday. We have some business that we've got to take care of once we get in country in the capital. Uh, we are shipping a container of scripture and personal goods, and we are importing a vehicle. The vehicle is very, very, it's a very integral part of the, of the ministry there because much of the population is in the rural areas. A lot, of, a lot of the ministry is, uh, is facilitated by the vehicle. And so we're importing that. The, uh, the funds are there. Uh, we, we have the money for all that. The Lord has provided that. The, the thing we need prayer about is uh, timing because once this uh, TEP, Lord willing, gets approved, uh, we, ha we get two exemptions on personal goods and the vehicle. And this is going to save us a lot of money. I'm not talking about just a few thousand dollars. I'm talking about a lot of money. And so, but it is time sensitive. We get three months from the time we get our passports stamped with that visa to get those in the country. And so we would appreciate your prayers there. And uh, so that's, that's what's going on in Zimbabwe. We're very excited. The, uh, the anticipation's kind of building and uh, we're, we're really busy back home, but we're, we're excited and we're thankful that the Lord's um, going to let us have a part in what's going on in Zimbabwe. Just to give you an idea of the need, there are 16 million people in Zimbabwe. Uh, there are two what we would call Bible-believing missionaries that we know of there. And so 
We, we know of, of a handful of people that are praying about going there. The Lord's up to something in Zimbabwe, probably like something similar he did in the Philippines year, years ago. Uh, I've, I, I've, I've heard it described as that, and so we're excited about being a part of that, and we would appreciate your prayers uh, in, in, in these matters and that God would have uh, his hand in, in our lives. And we're assured and we're, without a shadow of a doubt that this is what the Lord wants us to do, and there's great contentment in that. And uh, so we... We, we appreciate you having us in. And if you have any questions, please see me after the service. If you have any questions about the ministry, about Zimbabwe, about my family, please uh, don't hesitate to ask me. Be glad to try to answer. I can't promise you I have an answer, but uh, be glad to try to answer whatever you may have. If there's nothing else, we'll transition right on into the message. Um, turn to the book of Ephesians. Book of Ephesians. I've had it in my mind while in deputation to... Uh, to go through the Pauline epistles and to outline these. Um, you know, I, I read commentaries. I read other men because, uh, in essence, you know, if you come up with something that you think is original, it, it, might, it may be dangerous. But um, what, what I've did is I've tried to stay away from, you know, reading commentaries and other people's, other people's work because I just, I just want a fresh idea. And then I'll go back after and, you know, just make sure things are, are somewhat sound. And so I, I, I got through Romans, got to 1 Corinthians, and I just really, really got stuck. Got in 2 Corinthians, moved on through Galatians, now I'm in Ephesians. So naturally, my sermons are going to flow out of that because that's where I'm at. But I want to preach to you tonight on the devil's will. And, um, you know, the Lord has a will, and the devil is in opposition of that, right? Amen. The Lord had a will in the garden, the devil had his will. And um, so... <clears throat> Uh, you, you all know this, I, I'm sure. Churches in America, by and large, are in a mess. Now, I'm, I, I'm, not, I, I'm including all, we would say, evangelical, but even a lot of Baptists and even a lot of Bible-believing Baptists are in trouble. And I know this is dangerous. You know, I don't want to be like a Calvinist and, and, and categorize somebody as this and say, if you're not in this category, you're in this category. But at the same time, I think it is beneficial to... to you know what happened in 1 Corinthians is we, we, get to, we get to chapters 5 through uh, 16 and that's where we dwell at because that's where most of the problems are at. What we don't do is we don't get to the root of the issue which is in chapter 1 and it's pride, right? There's contentions among them and they're saying, well, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas. And then they bring Jesus Christ down to the level of men which is, uh, that, that's pride in essence. And it, it's, it's an exaltation of man and it's a de-exaltation of God. And what we don't do is we... We try, we, it's a satanic device because uh, the devil wants you to dwell on your problems. Because if, if, if you stay there and you never get to the root of the problem, you won't get the problem fixed and you'll get depressed, you'll quit, and all of the above. And so um, when, when we talk about this, you know, what, what in, in your mind, you don't have to answer this out loud, what would be the one thing that's plaguing the churches the most? And so we could talk about things like affluence, right? That... I can go to Zimbabwe, and there are people that will walk two hours one way to get to church. You know, I don't know, maybe there's church members that, uh, of this church that live 15 minutes away and won't drive that. Um, you, you got people that don't have anything else, and they just want to go to church. They want to hear the Word of God. And affluence, um, money, and, 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 and the want of things, if we're honest, it affects us. But I don't think that's the worst thing. Then we talk about COVID, and COVID has had a very negative effect on a lot of churches. It has really plagued a lot of churches. We talk about politics. This divides churches. You know, people would rather uh, be, a, uh, be a campaign manager for Donald Trump than to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And so politics, it, it'll divide a church. Wickedness, you know, that, that, that's an obvious one. We talk about this New Age movement, in es which in essence is a rejection of the Bible. Right, the music will go, then they'll get a different Bible, and then all these other things come in. And so, Second uh, Corinthians two, you don't have to turn there. Uh, Paul says, "Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices." Now, I think that's interesting because he's talking to the church at Corinth. He says, "He says we are not ignorant of his devices." It, it's like he he he's just assuming that they know that how how the devil operates. And so, um. The devil has devices, 
And Paul says we're not ignorant of it. And when we think about the word ignorant, we, we think about the opposite of that. What would that be? It would be knowledge, right? When you call somebody ignorant, it's, it's, not, it's not a derogatory term. I'm ignorant of a lot of things. And some of the things I'm ignorant of, I'm thankful. Like, for instance, I, I'll give you a funny one. I don't drink coffee. People think I'm crazy. My wife is still trying to convert me. And I say, I'm not going to drink it because I'm ignorant. I don't know if I like it or not, and that's the way I want it. I'm ignorant of it. So ignorance is not necessarily, it, it's not a derogatory term. But uh, the question is, do, do you know what the devil's devices are? You personally, because he is the enemy. He is the one that's... Uh, that's trying to undermine everything that God is doing. And he, ha he has devices. He has ways. He has methods of how he does this. And the question is, do you know that? Some time ago, I, I went through and, and, and did a study on this. And so, uh, you know, the devil tempts. He ensnares. He devours. He condemns. He lays in wait. And he oppresses. There are a lot of other, other of these. But he, but he deceives, right? You don't get out of Genesis 3 that you find this out. And, it, and it's curious that he takes the very thing that God uses to instruct Adam to deceive them. He uses the word of God to deceive them. And so this, this, this is the devil. In Revelation 12, he is what? He is deceiving the entire world. The devil is the deceiver. And so the thing that fuels ignorance and deception is unawareness. And that, that, that is the devil's will. Um... Unawareness is simply this. It means without thought or inattentiveness. And so this is the devil's will. This is the thing that's undermining the unity in the body of Christ. You're never so close to the devil as when you're unaware. When you're not mindful of what's going on. And, you know, there, there's things that we do in life. You know, when I brush my teeth, I'm not, I'm not sitting there saying, well, you know, I'm cleaning my teeth. This is good for my teeth. And those type things. I'm talking about the important things. In Ephesians chapter 1 through 3, the, the book is laid out in a, in a very simple way. Ephesians 1 through 3, it's about things that God wants you to know. And then, the, the, so in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 21, Paul says, Amen. At the end of the verse, there, there's a definite break. He says, I therefore, the, uh, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy. That's chapter 4 verse 1. There, there's a definite break. And so the... Uh, the um, uh, the, 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 the direction of the book somewhat changes here. So Paul, Paul is transitioning from the knowledge of something to your walk. What you know to what you do. And so Paul, Paul the, that's what the rest of the book is about there. It's about your walk. It's about walking worthily in, in chapter 4. It's about walking wisely in chapter 5. It's about walking warringly in chapter 6. And so the devil's not necessarily worried about your walk. He wants to get you on the front end. He wants to get you on what you know, and he wants to get you to be unaware of what's going on because if he can get you unaware, he ain't got to worry about your walk. That, that, that's just going to naturally follow. Okay, and so in chapter 1, we'll start there. Chapter 1, I, I call it the, the knowledge of his will, the knowledge of the Lord's will. The devil doesn't want you to know the will of God. Look in verse 9. <clears throat> having made known unto us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure which He hath purposed in Himself. Now, I'm not trying to insult your intelligence. I know that you guys are not, you're, you're not a stranger to the Bible, but you do understand that God wants everybody to be saved. It is His will that everybody would come to know Him and, and to be in Him. If you're in here and you're not saved tonight, you need to get saved. You need to trust Jesus Christ uh, you're not saved because you grew up in America. You're not saved because you grew up in a, in a Christian environment. You're not saved because you come to church. You're not saved because you put money in the offering plate. You're not saved because you confess your sins. If you're in here and you're saved, you want to know why you got saved? It's because you trusted what Jesus Christ did on your behalf. Amen. And so God wants everybody to be saved. And it's, I'm sure that every one of you in here know that. But are you aware of that? In your day-to-day -day walk, in your day-to-day -day life, are you aware of that? And if you are, what are you doing about it? Amen. Now, what, you, know what's, you know what's really easy? And this, this is a blessing when a church gets a hold of this. When, when you've got, uh, you got a parade and you all come together and you minister together. That, that builds unity. That's the way the body of Christ is supposed to be. 
But y'all can't be together all the time. You, you got to go to work. You got to go to the store. You got to live your life. I'm talking about the times when it's not scheduled. I'm talking about when you're out there and the Holy Ghost says, hey, I want you to go there and I want you to do this. And you know what we do a lot of times? We're a Jonah and we stiff arm the Lord and we just go the other way. And so, you know, but, but, what, but, but, but here's what happens. What you're not doing is saying, you know what, Lord, I want that person to go to hell. You just switch it off and you're unaware. Right? Because I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think at all that any of you want somebody to go to hell in here. You, right? We want people to get saved. We want people to know the Lord Jesus Christ. But what happens is, is we get unaware. And that's, that, that's the devil's will. He wants you to be unaware that God wants everybody to be saved. Because when, when you're unaware that he wants everybody to be saved, that's not going to be your priority. Look in verse um, 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. Paul says, I'm praying that the Lord will give you something personally. So the devil doesn't want you to, to know the will of God as far as salvation. He doesn't want you to know the will of God personally. What I mean by that is, um, how many of you, even in your occupation, asked the Lord about it before, before you took it, right? Uh, it, it took me a long time to, get it, to, to even get in my walk where I, where I would ask the Lord about, you know, I'm working here. Lord, do you want me here? Do you want me here or do you want me somewhere else? Do, do you want me here or do you want me, do you want me to go do something else? And so it's, it's not just the pastors. It's not just the missionaries. It's not just uh, the evangelists and all these people that, that need to seek the Lord. It's, it, it's the people that got to get up and go to work in the morning. It's the people that, 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 um, that, that make this thing happen. And the Lord, has, the Lord has a sphere of influence for you. And, and if we're not careful, we'll, we're going to get that mixed up. And we're going to get unaware of what, of what God has for us in our lives. And when, so when, when that happens, the devil comes in and he thwarts the plan of God because he'll have you somewhere that you're not supposed to be. It's, it, it's, it's unawareness. In, um, in verse 18 of the same chapter, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Paul is talking to saved people and he's, he's, he's praying that they'll be enlightened. Saved people need enlightenment. Amen. And so um, in verses 19 and 20, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead? Now listen, if you're sitting out there and you say, I can't do the will of God or whatever, whatever the Lord's put on your heart, there's power that if you're saved that works in you that raised Amen. Jesus Christ from the dead. That's the same power that's in you that's in me. Amen. There's no reason that we can't do what God would have us to do. Now, you remember that the next time the Lord puts something on your heart and you feel real skittish about it. Just, just do it. Listen, it would be amazing what would happen. The, the news at 5 o'clock tomorrow evening I guarantee you'd be different if every single one of God's people got up in the morning and said, I'm just going to obey the Holy Ghost and I'm going to do what He tells me to do. I'm talking about in one day that America would be turned upside down. But what, what, what's happened is we're unaware. We, we've got sucked into this American dream and this American mentality and our minds are over here. This has to do with our mind. I'm not talking about the brain and God's over here, but our minds are over here and we're unaware. This, this is the devil's will. Chapter 2, chapter two. This I call this the knowledge of God's work. And so the devil doesn't want you to know the work of God. Look in verse uh, 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. The devil wants you to forget that you are dead. He wants you to forget that you're alive because if he can get you to that place, he can get you to get depressed. He can get you to quit. Um, you know what the problem is for us most of the time? And you know how we combat... Uh, falsehood, right? We believe the truth. That's, that, that, that's the combatants to, to, to falsehood. I remember at work one time, I was with a bunch of men and we were talking about some things 
and I got carried away and I was talking about politics and the economy that was this was during COVID and I and I and I got carried away with it and I, my heart began to get troubled and as I'm walking back to my desk John 14 1 comes to mind let not your heart be troubled and so all, all of those bad thoughts I had, they fled with the truth. And so the devil wants you to be unaware of this. It's, it's not that you don't want to have access to it. You have it right here, but he wants you to be unaware of that. He wants, you, he wants your mind to be somewhere else. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, Among whom also we had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. This has to do with unawareness, and we're by nature the children of wrath, even as others. He wants you to forget that you've got an old man. He wants you to forget that you've got a new way. You find out in Ephesians chapter 4, we're supposed to put off the old man, supposed to put on the new. And I listen, I, I had, I guess you, I don't know what you call this, an epiphany or whatever, just a couple of months ago. Uh, there were some things in my life that the old man was running that I was unaware of. And it, and, it, and, it, and it was a book that I was listening to, and I can't dare recommend it to you because of the, of, of the language, but it was by, by an ex-Navy SEAL, and the Lord brought some things to my mind and showed me that these, this, this part of my life that I was completely unaware of, this, this was the old man. And this, the, this is what the devil and, and your, your old man wants to do because that, they're deceptive. They want you unaware of what's going on, and then they get you ineffective. Uh, in, 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 cha in chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Then look in verse 11. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh. Right? He says you're created in Christ unto good works. He says I want you to remember. I want you to remember some things. I want you to remember who you were. I don't want you to dwell there. I just want you to remember that. And then, then uh, because you're created unto good works. And the devil wants us unaware of that. In verse 12, it talks about um, that, at, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. He wants you to forget that. He wants you to get your hope misplaced. He wants you to forget who you are in the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 3, I call this the, the knowledge of his wisdom the devil doesn't want you to know the wisdom of God. Look in verse 10 of chapter 3. Verse 10 of chapter 3. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heaven and heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, which is purposed in verse 11 in Jesus Christ. You know what happened? God fixed this thing where he would get the glory. In, in, in the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 1, Paul's going through there, and in, in essence what he's telling them is, is that Jesus Christ, it, it, it has to do with, uh, the gospel has to do with Jesus Christ. Then he gets to the end of the chapter, and he says that no flesh should, uh, that, uh, that no flesh should glory in himself, something to that effect, uh, and that all flesh should glory in, in, in the Lord. Because um, what happens is, is on March the 1st of 2008, when I, when I got saved, I had nothing to glory in myself because I didn't, the only thing I did is I did what God said and I trusted Jesus Christ. I didn't make that available. He made that available. And so he gets the glory because I trusted him. And what the, Lord, and what, and what the devil wants, wants, you to, uh, want, wants you to be unaware of is that fact. Because once you get aware of that fact, what happens is that pride, which is, it, it's in there, it's in all of us, and it gets to welling up, and we get, we get to want, we get we get the opposite of John the Baptist, right? We, we're going to increase, and we're going to decrease God, and so the devil wants you unaware of that. You don't have to turn there, but in Luke uh, chapter eleven, verse forty-nine, there's something something curious here. Uh, Luke eleven forty-nine, the Bible says this: <clears throat> Therefore also said the wisdom of God. I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of they and some of them they shall slay and persecute. That's God talking. It says, but but it says, therefore saith the wisdom of God. And so the devil doesn't want you to know the word of God. He doesn't want you to know the truth. He doesn't want you to know Jesus Christ like you're supposed to. Now you know there are two different knowings of the Lord. There's knowing him as Savior, and then there's there's a deeper knowing. Right in Philippians chapter 10, Paul said. 
that I may know him. Right? Well, what's wrong, Paul? Are you lost? Well, no, no, no. He's not lost. He's talking about a deeper knowing. And <clears throat> this, this is rooted, if you'll look in chapter 4, verse 20 in the book of Ephesians, he says, but ye have not so learned Christ. Then he goes through there. He says, if so, um, be that ye have heard him and have been taught of him as the truth is in Jesus. Then he says that you put off concerning the, the former man. Then he says that you be renewed in the spirit of, a, of your mind, which is putting off the old man, putting on the new. You know what he's saying is, he says, you don't know Jesus Christ like you're supposed to if you don't apply what you know. Right? You're supposed to take the knowledge that you have and do something with it. And boy, are we, this, I'm talking about him guilty. All the knowledge that we have and we don't do anything with it. There's a bunch of Zimbabweans that love to have in their head what you got. They'd love to have in their mind what you've been given. They'd love to have a Bible Institute where you can come in and go through a program and somebody sit down and, and, and teach you the Bible. The devil wants you unaware of the wisdom of God. In verse 19 of chapter 3, uh, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. The Lord wants you to, the Lord wants you to know this love, the love of Christ, which, which passeth knowledge. Okay, you got to get past the knowledge to get to this. And if, and if, and if you're unaware, you, you don't get there, right? And you say, well, how is this possible? Well, this very, very, very um, um, familiar verses to us in verses 20 and 21. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Now we, we quote this all the time, but the context is you, is you knowing the love of Christ which, pass, which passeth all understanding. God's going God's to make that available to you, but you've got to be aware. And so the love of Christ is simply this. It was a man that sacrificed himself for somebody that did him wrong. Right? Je Jesus Christ was put on the cross uh, unjustly. That is, what, that is what, the, what, the love of God, what the love of Christ is. And you know the very next thing Paul addresses in chapter 4? He, he's addressing the, the unity. The unity in the body of Christ. And so for unity, we're going to have to know this love of Christ, right? Because some of you in here, you're going to offend each other. This is just the way it happens, right? Uh, you, uh, maybe Brother Doug gets up here and, and he mentions something that somebody did and he just, he didn't on purpose do it, but he just forgot to mention your name and we, you start snarling your nose up and you're like, why didn't you mention me? And so we do all these things. So we, we got to have the love of Christ and that's what promotes unity. And so... Paul, that's what Paul is addressing here in the first part of chapter 4. And so you know what's happened in the church. You know when a church breaks down, it's when the, when the unity goes, right? And, and we start fighting about things that don't matter. We start, we start fighting about the, 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 the carpet. We start fighting about, you know, what, what so-and-so's wearing. We start fighting about what so-and-so said. Well, so-and-so didn't invite me over their house. So-and-so didn't invite me to this gathering. And we start just fighting about very, very mundane things that we shouldn't even be fighting about. And you know what we do? We get unaware of what God has given to Bible Baptist Church, to all the other local churches that are scattered throughout the earth. And our job is to get, the, get His gospel to the world, to get His gospel to New Philadelphia, Ohio, to get His gospel to Zimbabwe, to the Philippines, to China, all these other places. And that this, this is the devil's will. He wants you unaware. So the, the, the question is, are you unaware? And I, I, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about spiritual things. I'm talking about where is your focus? Where is your mind? Not your brain. I'm talking about the real you. What, where is it at? <clears throat> now, uh, we, we'll end up here. And I'm just going to give you some areas of danger. I'm not going to comment a lot on them. But I just want to give you these because they're prevalent in our, in our culture and in our society. Now, the first of these is social media. Um, now, now, if you really want to know what's going on with all this stuff, study that word media. Study the fact that it means the middleman. Study, and so, so you know what that means is when you're looking at the media, you're not looking at the real thing. Somebody's on the other side of that. The media is only, it's only the middleman. I didn't say it was wrong. 
I just said, we need to ask ourselves who's on the other side. I, I go into churches all the time, and this that Brother Doug didn't say anything, but I, I, pastors all the time are telling me these problems that they have to deal with, and the, and the problem is social media. It's undermining the unity, and it, what it does is it gets you unaware to reality. Sports. Listen, I, from the time I was seven years old until I was almost 20, I played football. I lived that. I breathed it. I ate it. I'd rather play ball than eat. That's, I, I worship that stuff. What it does is it gets you... So, so all those years that I was lost, you know, you know why I didn't think about eternity a whole lot? Because I was unaware of it. I had my mind on an oblong ball. Sports gets us unaware. Silliness. You know what I find very curious in the Gospels? You don't find Jesus Christ laughing. Now, listen, I, I know he laughed. I, I know, I'm not saying he didn't laugh. You're not going to find that in the Gospels. And I, listen, that's not a coincidence that the Holy Ghost did, did not put that in our Bibles. Um, our society is silly. They're not serious about anything. And that's why you can go talk to somebody about going to hell and they'll laugh in your face I was in Nashville uh, back last year passing out tracks, and I, I'm, look, I'm in a bar, and these people are walking out of a bar, and they're singing, I'm on, I'm on the highway to hell, and they're laughing about it. That's foolishness. Th those people are not serious. They're unaware. Self-admiration, self that's, that's pride. These things lull us into unawareness. You know what? It'd be a shame... To, to get to the end of this thing, get to the end of your life and find out that you did more for the devil than you did Jesus Christ. I'm talking about saved people. I'm, I'm trusting that most of you in here are saved. I, and I'm talking about this in my own life. We need to go read 1 Corinthians 3 quite, quite often, put ourselves out there at the judgment seat of Christ because it is a literal, physical day that we're all going to stand before, b b before the Lord Jesus Christ and what's going to happen to a lot of us, and what I'm, what, what I'm afraid is going to happen to me, is we're going to have a lot of smoke, and we're going to have a lot of loss. And it doesn't have to be that way. This, this is not a message about your knowledge level, but it's simply about unawareness. I, I'm just trying to raise awareness, trying to get you to think about some things, because it, because it is the devil's will to get you unaware. He wants you to be unaware of the will of God. He wants you to be unaware of, of, of the work of God, what the Lord did for you, what you are in Jesus Christ versus what you feel. And he wants you to, get, he wants you to be unaware of the wisdom of God. I hope you all think, think and uh, be aware and uh, pray about this message. This is um, our enemies at work, and he wants you unaware he he listen he's fine with you coming to church he's fine with you going to bible institute he just wants you unaware of what reality right. and what what the main things mean in life Amen. i'll pray and turn it back over to you brother lord thank you god for your goodness we thank you for the word uh we thank you god for the holy ghost that you've given us to convey truth to us through your word father I pray, Lord, that you would continue to have your hand on this church. I pray, Lord, that you'd guide their affairs with this building, God, and that you'd give it to them, Lord, and help it to be a, help it to be a blessing to the community, and Lord, that souls would come in and get saved. And I pray, Lord, that you would give them favor with that. Lord, uh, continue to multiply their efforts. Lord, I, I appreciate them. They've been a blessing to me. And uh, Lord, help us together to labor for you and to be aware, God, of what, of what you want. Lord, we ask it in, in the name of Jesus Christ, our brother. Amen.